Good afternoon. My name is Adam Rubenfire, and I'll be moderating today's Modern Healthcare webinar, Leading Through the Changing World of Healthcare. In this webinar, we'll share how healthcare organizations can enhance the caregiver experience at the point of care. The consumerization of healthcare and the rise of value-based care models has put greater focus on the point of care experience. While much of that focus has been on patients, systems are recognizing that enhancing the caregiver experience is critical to achieving their mission. Caregiver experience can greatly impact the overall quality of care and lead to better clinical outcomes. Both are essential to the clinical and financial success of any healthcare delivery uh, organization. We'd like to thank the sponsor of today's webinar, the Jack Welch Management Institute. At the Jack Welch Management Institute, MBA students have a unique opportunity to learn directly from Jack Welch and other experts of practice, some of today's most influential executives. Jack's winning and time-tested philosophy on leadership development, people management, and more are woven throughout every element of the program. And a team of their top-ranked their top-ranked MBA program is 100% online, flexible, and fully accredited. The Jack Welch Healthcare MBA combines leadership and business skills from our core MBA curriculum with the operations, finance, technology, and policy tools needed within the many facets of our industry. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. We want this webinar to be an interactive experience for you, our audience. You're encouraged to ask questions using the questions pane in your GoToWebinar <laughs> attendee panel. Our speaker will try to address as many of your questions as, as he has time for. In addition, if you'd like to minimize the attendee panel for a better view of the presentation slides, click the double arrows at the top of the panel. You can also resize the window by grabbing the corner of the screen with your mouse. Before we get, begin, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's presentation. Dr. David Theodoro is the president and chairman of the SSM Health Heart and Vascular Institute. He also serves as the Chairman, Board of Directors of SSM Health's Clinical Integrated Network, Gateway Quality Physician Alliance. Dr. Theodoro has over 20 years of clinical and executive leadership in private medical groups, employed medical groups, hospital-based integrated delivery networks, and entrepreneurial startup ventures. He is an expert in strategic development and implementation, including organic growth, acquisition, operational improvement, process design, and optimization and new business development. He earned his medical degree from the Washington University School of Medicine and completed his cardiothoracic residency at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Theodoro is certified by the American Board of Thoracic Surgery and is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. He holds an MBA from the Jack Welch Management Institute. And with that, we're ready to begin the presentation. Dr. Theodoro, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks a lot, Adam, and um, hello, everyone. It's certainly my pleasure to be here with you, and thank you, the audience, so much for joining. Um, over the next little bit of time together, I'd like to discuss, as Adam indicated, a very important and far-reaching topic, the rapid change taking place in healthcare today, and I know that we all feel that. I'd like to give a special thanks to Modern Healthcare and the Jack Welch Management Institute for providing me this opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. As Adam indicated, for the past 22 years, I've been an actively practicing cardiac surgeon in St. Louis, and during most of this time, I've been very involved in healthcare administration as well as the business of healthcare. Care. For nearly 20 years, I've overseen an expanding and now very large cardiovascular delivery platform. And for the past seven or eight years, I've also been very involved in matters of population health management. Uh, as Adam indicated, I completed my Jack Welch Management Institute MBA program nearly two years ago, and this was just truly a remarkable experience. Now, I'm going to go off script for just a second and read a slightly edited excerpt from a new book by Whitney Johnson called Disrupt Yourself. I believe it nicely applies to the nature of this webinar event, um, and so here's the excerpt. High growth organizations need high growth individuals, startups, growth stage companies, private equity backed companies, and certainly healthcare companies undertaking needed transformation all have one thing in common. They need high growth individuals to execute high growth plans. As a leader trying to achieve ambitious organizational goals, you need people who can do more than just keep up. You need people who can set the pace. You need high growth individuals. So organizations undergoing transformative change need leaders looking to instill innovative thinking within their teams. And certainly the current healthcare dynamic fits this bill. 
We're living in an era of accelerating disruption, and no one is immune. The author indicates that managing the so-called S-curve waves of learning and mastering innovation and disruption are requisite skills for the future. If you want to be successful in unexpected ways and achieve your wildest goals, then you must follow your own disruptive path. Dare to innovate. Dare to do something astonishing. Dare to disrupt yourself. So this ends the excerpt. As it would turn out, I'm currently and in the moment orchestrating my own personal disruption. So I guess you could say I'm sort of taking my own medicine. I've organized my remarks into three categories. First, general business principles that I find useful and remarkably important. Next, a granular assessment of healthcare value creation. And finally, I'll briefly discuss the concept of organizational health. So let's get going. Adam, the next slide, please. I know what you're thinking. He loaded the wrong slide deck. But actually, no, I didn't. The John Fabric Tractor Company is one of the largest Caterpillar sales and service dealerships in the world. It's headquartered in St. Louis and was founded over 100 years ago. I'm personal friends with John Fabic Jr., and his father had a simple guiding vision that exists to this day. Next, please. To ever serve our customer better. This simple and far-reaching goal has been their guiding vision, their guiding purpose from the very beginning, and I believe it's just as applicable in, in healthcare today. Next. The rate and volatility of change in healthcare today, as I think we would all agree, is astonishing, absolutely astonishing. That change comes in many forms from payment reform with value-based upside gain and downside risk arrangements, escalating outcomes, safety, and cost accountability, DRG migration primarily from the acute setting to the ambulatory setting, non-traditional new entrants, access platform expansion, rapid consolidation, labor market challenges, new digital platforms, shifting consumer demands, margin compression, rapidly aging population, economic, regulatory, and legislative changes, and the list goes on. Truly, we're experiencing a, a an astonishing rate of change in healthcare today. Next. Given these far-reaching changes, I believe we'd all agree that it's time to think different. Next. Every healthcare leader, in my opinion, should constantly be asking this question. Do we care enough to transform our care? I'd like to make a quick distinction between care used as a verb, compassion, empathy, interest, concern, and perhaps even hospitality, and compare that to care when used as a noun, the provision of what is necessary for the health and welfare of someone, and I'll generally carry this distinction throughout the remainder of my remarks. Next. My first goal is to present several fundamental leadership ideas and principles in their simplest and most relevant forms. Next. An initial aspiration of any business is to develop and advance a fundamental guiding vision, a guiding purpose, a cause, a belief. A business also must carefully protect its employees and, of course, generate a profit. Next. I really believe that the order here matters a lot. This, of course, is my personal point of view and one that I'll certainly emphasize throughout our time together. Um, but, but leaders should relentlessly pursue employee engagement, operational excellence, and ever better customer service. I truly believe that these, these three pillars or guide, um, guide posts help us a, on, on our journey to, to value creation. Next. Leaders just must inspire their teams, constantly present their organizations in new and relevant ways, and certainly in health healthcare and beyond, develop customer-centric, value-based business models. Next. Here are several fundamental, high-level, and somewhat contemplative leadership questions that I find important. Do we have a clear vision for the future? How will we transform and revitalize ourselves? And will we remain true to our, to our guiding purpose? Next. 
it's worth spending an extra moment, in my opinion, on the characteristics of a guiding purpose. And, and, and generally, uh, it's a, a guiding purpose is described as aspirational and optimistic, inclusive and open to all, in service to and for the benefit of others, resilient or enduring, and big and bold. So if we remember just just several slides ago when I indicated that the Fabic, John Fabic Tractor Company had as its guiding purpose to ever serve our customers better. I think you could quickly and mentally check off each of these important characteristics of a guiding purpose and understand that to ever serve our customers better is, is truly an aspirational um, guiding purpose. Next. All leaders must constantly scan for new ideas, cutting edge technology, unique opportunities, and any more, and certainly in healthcare, synergistic and non traditional partnerships. Next. A new and evolving perspective is that of the outcome economy. It's certainly extremely relevant in healthcare today. So, an outcome economy is an economy contingent on selling goods and services based on results or outcomes they produce for their customers, or in our case, patients, rather than a standard price based transaction. So, in the new outcome economy, if you can't define the outcome, you needn't worry about an outcome-based business model. And I believe that most of the audience would agree that we are rapidly transitioning in healthcare to a an, an outcome-based business model. So now I'd like to transition from these general business principles to how they may play out in the healthcare space. Next. It's my opinion that healthcare's highest purpose is to ever care for our patients better. I believe this serves as a, as a timeless and a universal and uncontested goal, but it's certainly not a simple goal to ever care for our patients better as a guiding purpose. Next. Generally, at its most fundamental level, healthcare transformation involves new ways to create value and then the development of new business models that capture that value. And I'd like to go relatively deep into um, at least my perspective of healthcare value creation, as I mentioned. Next. So healthcare value is, is many times thrown around as somewhat of a buzzword and is typically defined as outcomes over cost, but actually it's vastly more nuanced, vastly more specific, and quite frankly, a lot more complicated than just calling healthcare value outcome over cost. Uh, in my opinion, a much richer definition of healthcare value is patient-specific, condition-specific improved outcomes over the full cycle of care provided in a cost-effective way. It's important to, to remember that the most relevant unit of analysis is the actual patient. I'm going to really stress that point. Uh, populations, even though we talk a lot about population health managers, populations generally do not show up and become um, utilizers of, of, of and consumers of healthcare resources, an individual patient does. And so um, it, it'll certainly be a point stressed throughout my remarks that, that the relevant and most important unit of analysis when we begin to talk about real healthcare value creation is the individual patient. I also believe that a vital point is the that unique healthcare value creation is the most important metric for uh, competitive differentiation and, and um, I will not be shy about talking, in my opinion, about the importance of differentiation. Next. So improving value for patients is the real centerpiece in all transformation efforts. And furthermore, it's really the only true North Star that can resolve and guide the multiple strategic choices that all organizations are going to need to make during whatever transformation efforts they may be engaging. So you know once again and perhaps a little simpler than 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 those remarks the the only goal that that can guide strategy is improving value for patients we'll talk about a number of ways that value is improved but really at the individual patient level the only goal that can then guide the strategy is is value at the patient level next so here are three fairly universal goals that just about i would say anybody involved in healthcare change can pretty easily rally around improving clinical outcomes, expanding access, and uh, repositioning healthcare as an economic driver. And in particular, we have to change the current dynamic, in my opinion, and grab hold of the narrative that healthcare is a cost 
certainly is now, but we're here to talk about healthcare change and demonstrate importantly that healthcare can be positioned, repositioned as an actual economic driver. So I think that's a sort of an important mental model to, to, to keep in mind as we embark on various uh, transformation and change journeys. Next. First and foremost, again, healthcare transformation is all about outcome improvement, which is patient specific, condition specific, risk adjusted, and data driven. So lots of words, relatively easy words, easy words to talk about, and we all do, but to actually take and execute on 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 these underlying pillars of outcome improvement um, is not an easy task at all, but vitally important. Next. It's also important to fully understand that you can't optimize a healthcare value model across a heterogeneous population. So I've indicated optimize a value model over a heterogeneous population can't be done because outcomes uh, have little meaning in when, when applied to heterogeneous cohorts of patients and cost comparisons in heterogeneous patients are generally irrelevant. So another important mental model, because I think that, that, that oftentimes it's easy for, for teams to, to lump patients in cohorts big enough that the, the degree of heterogeneity isn't fully understand, understood. And again, if our goal is to optimize a healthcare value model, I think we've got to be super cognizant of, the, of this heterogeneous um, dynamic. Next. So in its simplest form, healthcare transformation is really about enhanced and scaled accountability across a number of platforms, not the least of which are outcome, safety, and cost, and others. And new business models are about monetizing these accountabilities. Um, and I think that most would agree that in the current fee-for-service system, the payment for service and products and devices is not really at all associated with longer-term outcomes. Um, in, in other words, there's very little accountability in the current dominant payment system. I, I believe that's going to change and, and certainly is what is considered by most to be um, somewhat of a weak point, if not the, cre the, the key and, and pivotal weak point in the fee-for-service system. And I'm not certainly suggesting that, 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 that I have or anybody does have um, um, a, a particularly negative view of fee-for-service. It's just that the, the, the dialogue is the movement away from fee-for-service and enhanced accountability. And I think that those fee-for-service and accountability are completely decoupled at this particular point in time. Next. So for healthcare leaders, this question should probably be a constant reel running in your mind. How frequently in a given week, in a given day, in a given hour, are you focusing on outcomes across the, a host of platforms, clinical, economic, safety, and et cetera? A, a constant reel, in my opinion, that must be um, in, in every leader's mind, really at this point in time, all the time. Next. So here's a very important fundamental concept from my perspective. We have to have a clear longitudinal line of sight that links the cost of treatment to the long-term outcome in order to define in order to define um, the value proposition and subsequently develop the appropriate business model. So we must have a better understanding um, of the outcome, what the outcome is, who realizes the outcome, and when is it fully realized? Next. This is yet another uh, important concept from my perspective, um, and to, to consider it, and must be considered when you're developing your unique value, value offering. And this is the concept that was initially brought forth by Michael Porter from the Harvard Business School and recently championed by um, the current CEO of Medtronic, Omar Ishrak. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide. The, the true clinical and economic value of care, be that care from a product, a drug, a device, a procedure, a service, or what have you, is most commonly realized at a different point in time than when the cost was incurred. And, and so, again, 
as opposed to a fee-for-service system, which is decoupled in any longitudinal fashion from any facsimile or modicum of accountability. In the new world, I think we have to understand that the true clinical and economic value of care occurs in its full display at a time decoupled from when the cost is incurred. Super important concept from my perspective. You really have to have a clear line of sight in, in complete and uh, of the complete and relevant cycle of care to fully understand the value that's created with a specific treatment. And moreover, when we really get down to the brass tacks, value-based health care is about tying the two together in a fluid and, and, and a transparent way. Next. We absolutely must understand why and how something is of value and how a new business model can, can capture this value. So a leader's job must include learning how to measure outcomes and cost over extended periods of time, this longitudinal line of sight that I spoke about, in a patient-specific, risk-adjusted, objective and fair way. Because if, we, if we're going to really talk about the definition of the true value of care, it is really linking outcomes and uh, both both clinical and economic outcomes to the cost um, over the entire relevant care uh, care cycle. Next, any transformation effort um, has as um, you know its success and will have its success depend on a quantified differential value proposition that's granular sustainable, reproducible, and, and scalable. And as I mentioned, value can come in many different forms and will be different for, for institutions. It will be different for different regions of the country, but in general, it can, it can come in the form that is value and outcomes and safety, experience, service access, new digital engagement platforms, research if you're an academic medical center, commercialization of intellectual property, unique and non-traditional partnerships and even unique asset configuration. Um, but, but again, the most important unit of analysis is the individual patient, no matter what your value proposition or value platform may, may be based on. Next. Let me once again stress that providers will have to differentiate their way to relevance and success because in an environment of more severe cost containment, I believe we all would agree that we're in that environment. All provider stakeholders risk commoditization, super bad, um, if there's no patient-specific data-driven quantitative differential value. So um, to differentiate is to protect against commoditization. And I think that there's in any number of of examples in systems and markets where they may be um, considered a not necessary or perhaps even irrelevant. And those systems are, are, are certainly risk the chance to be um, viewed as a commodity as opposed to a defined quantitative um, differential value proposition. Next. So in the context of healthcare transformation, you must ask and answer what seems to be a relatively simple question, but it's not at all simple to, to answer. What works for who and why and what are the trade-offs? And then to strive for patient-specific data-driven outcome improvement. Again, for great success, you just have to differentiate. Now, for just a moment, we're going to actually go deeper into the weeds and present a framework for the development of a, of a unique value offering, be that a bundled payment for care improvement, so-called BPCI, for instance, in the joint replacement space, the congestive heart failure management space, cardiac surgery, be that cabbage or valves, or even in the Medicare Advantage or other capitated risk contracts. And you know, in my opinion, this is really what it takes, again, getting down to the, to the, to the granular components of a quantified differential value proposition, assessment of the disease at a granular level, patient-specific risk stratification, and a knowledge and an expectation of an expected outcome. Then there needs to be the definition of a time horizon for which you are accountable for both outcome and cost. 
within the ability to calculate your baseline cost. I believe that this is um, not a foregone conclusion in many systems. And then finally, the ability to build a business model around the value proposition that you're unlocking. So if we're really to take the, the most granular um, assessment, in my opinion, of a quantified differential value proposition. I believe these um, these are the seminal pillars that help us define such a value proposition. Next. So stated another way, if you can quantify the expected risk-adjusted outcome in a given time frame, and if you can quantify your baseline cost to deliver the outcome, not easy to do, now you can have a meaningful, a substantive, a substantial discussion about the value that you can create and the new business models that you can develop. So in a nutshell, this is the fundamental basis for healthcare transformation, in my opinion. New business models that exploit value creation around outcome of improvement again at the patient level. Next. Finally, I'd like to transition from frameworks of value creation around care improvement to a detailed focus on the actual health of the organization that is charged with care improvement and care innovation. So organizational health is considered by many, in this case, Patrick Lencioni, to be the most unexploited opportunity in modern business and the single greatest competitive advantage that a company can achieve. And it's, it's probably worth keeping this slide up for a second. And, you know, there, there may be some naysayers and there may be some um, um, opposition to, to the opinions that um, are held by many. But in terms of where healthcare stands today and where we can be in many ways informed by other industries that have gone through their own transformation, organizational health is, is held out again by, by these two criteria that we can see. And I believe that um, wholeheartedly. Next. So the two major pillars of a healthy organization are highly functioning and cohesive teams, no surprise there, and organizational clarity. And we'll go deeper into to both the, um, the fundamental components of a co cohesive team as well as organizational clarity. And so when these two, team cohesion and clarity in, within your organization uh, are optimized and taken to scale, uh, I believe they offer a tremendous durable competitive advantage next. So Steve Jobs is a pretty successful guy. I think most would, would agree. And he believed that great things in business are never done by um, one person and they're generally always done by a team of people. So I think we can take some lead from, from an individual that is admired by most or was. Next. As leaders, we have to inspire, develop, and scale the fundamental components of highly functioning teams in order to drive superior results, right? It's all about results. So teams that demonstrate trust and cooperation, collaboration, and that leads to commitment and accountability are those teams that are, that are best uh, equipped to drive the superior results that will lead to uh, a differential value proposition um, as I see it. Next. In the opinion of most, the employee workforce is our most unique differentiation platform. Um, I believe would, most of us, if not all, would agree that there's always a human in the loop. And so the leader just has to create an environment that says, I hear you. I respect you. You matter. You really matter. And I care about you. Next. So these questions serve as a general framework for developing one's organizational clarity. And while they may seem relatively simple and perhaps straightforward, the exercise is quite important, especially in the context of a, a major change effort. So in my opinion, leaders must ask and answer, why do we exist? How do we behave? What do we do? How will we succeed? What do we do right now? And who does what? And I believe that that the the, the answer, if we were to just go through these one more time and put more more business like terms around them, why do we exist? Guiding purpose, vision, cause, beliefs. How do we behave? Values and culture. What do we do? That's usually pretty easy. It's the output of either our product or our our, our service offering. Why do customers come to us? Why do 
Why do customers hire us to do jobs? And then how will we succeed? Strategy. What do we do right now? The underlying tactics that stand up our strategy and who does what? The human part of core capabilities. And I truly do believe that 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 the 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 organizational clarity as as sort of defined by by these series of sim- simple questions, simple to ask, not so simple to answer all the time, needs to transcend and, and move quickly from the C-suite down to the actual trans- transactional uh, front line. And I, I believe that 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 that's really the the, the power behind organizational clarity is the entire team knows it, feels it, lives it, and abides by it. And especially those frontline workers where the actual transaction with our customers take place. Next. So I believe these are several um, important next level leadership questions. Um, do we inspire through our guiding purpose? And I think all leaders just, just have to ask these questions. Do we inspire through our guiding purpose? Do we engender trust, pride, and loyalty? And do we place care for and well-being of our people actually ahead of performance? And that may, you know, this last question in particular may spark a a raised eyebrow or two. However, it likely shouldn't because as a reference, the ultra-high performing special operations military teams, for instance, the Navy SEALs, follow this framework nearly to a T. So, so before performance in a high-performing special operations firm or team, inspiration with a guiding purpose, engendering trust, pride, and loyalty, and the feeling that the team is cared for is actually the driver of performance um, and certainly not subjugated uh, to performance. So they drive their performance by by these particular principles. I think that we can likely all take a lesson from from that that particular um, group of high form performing teams. Next, I'd like to say a few words in closing about the concept of will of the people. As leaders, we have to constantly engender feelings of care importance, voice, dignity, first through strength and clarity of our guiding purpose and also through intrinsic reward systems such as recognition, celebration, career advancements, um, among others. These are extremely important leadership lessons that are championed by Jack Welch and thoroughly reinforced um, throughout my time uh, at the JWMI MBA program. I, I can't tell you how important a, a, a dedicated concentration on these particular principles um, leading to enhanced, if you will, will of the people have, have been in my leadership journey. Next. So how do we define will of the people? Well, it's usually described by the following characteristics, morale, motivation, cooperation, collaboration, perhaps problem solving. But what really encapsulates the the, the phenomenon of will of the people is desire to engage and desire to offer discretionary effort by the workforce, by the employees, by the people. And while these two phenomenon or characteristics of will of the people are reasonably, in fact, quite difficult to objectively quantify. I think all all leaders, all really good leaders, uh, understand them inherently um, and, and and know and know when they see engagement and know when they when they when they see discretionary effort offered by their in- employee workforce. Next. So the will of the people really represents the sum total of all the human elements that contribute to the health of an organization. And, you know, sort of moreover, the will of the workforce or the employee base is described by many effort, many experts uh, as the most durable and nearly limitless competitive advantage that that any organization can can accrue. And so I would I would argue that, you know, we as leaders, if if we were to embrace this this concept of health of the organization and understand the that that cohesive and trusting teams and organizational clarity and will of the people are the are the fundamental fundamental linchpins, if you will, of a healthy organization. And again, many experts have directly coupled these components with competitive differentiation. Really do think this is this is extremely important. So I would say human will and its fundamental role in organizational health, I believe, is the next frontier in creating scalable and durable 
competitive advantage. And leaders have, interestingly, near total control over the source of will. So that's a, it's a it's a big it's a big responsibility. Total control over the source of will, and leaders have the ability to generate nearly an endless supply of will. Next, so likely, in my opinion, the most magical skill of great leaders is the ability to link the will of the people to transformation efforts. Again, there's a human in every loop and leaders control the loop. And I really truly believe that the art of change starts first with the heart. Next. Anyone leading change in healthcare or anywhere else for that matter would, would in my opinion, do well to embrace the following point of view put forth by Simon Sinek and any transformation change must create the feeling, ignite the passion, and provide inspiration that we are working to advance something bigger than ourselves. And I think this is, again, very important in healthcare today. So leaders, here's a final question. Do we really care enough to continually improve our care? Next. Again, the first form of care that I believe should be our primary focus is that care, as I've indicated, described by compassion and empathy, interest and concern, because this care in, informs the objective care that, that we deliver. Next, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone so very much for this opportunity to share my, my viewpoints on leadership and healthcare change, and I hope I've sparked at least the following two key mental frameworks. What can I do to help and how can I make a difference? I'll end with this mantra or call to action to ever care, both forms of care, to ever care for our patients better because I believe that this is where all transformation starts. Next. I really like this quote by William Arthur Ward. The pessimist complains about the wind. I'm sure many of you have seen it. The optimist expects it, the wind, to change. And the realists adjust the sales. I would argue that healthcare today um, is experiencing gale force like winds. So I believe we um, owe it to our patients to be excellent sale adjusters, uh, if not uh, recreators of the entire hull of the vessel. I'd like to once again thank the audience, Modern Healthcare, and the Jack Welch Management Institute for this um, opportunity uh, to, to, to spin this. 30 or 40 or so minutes with you. Adam? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Theodoro, for that fantastic presentation. Audience, we're going to move into our question and answer session. If you have questions, please continue to send them. We've, we've got a few questions, and uh, Dr. Theodoro, I'll pose one to you. How is healthcare leadership unique compared to other industries? What, what do healthcare leaders have to embody um, you know, that's unique to patient care or what, what, what we do in this industry? Well, so I, I think, Adam, that's a really good question. And first and foremost, there, there are likely not too many other industries where uh, at the end of the day, at least on the provider side, what you do has direct implications to a, to a human life, whether you're going to alleviate suffering and, and pain, restore health, maintain health. Um, and that, that's a, that's a, that's a really sacred vow um, and, and sacred responsibility that, that Really, anybody in healthcare uh, leadership, providers, and and you know any any number of uh, stakeholders up and down the supply chain line ha have to understand. You know, I've indicated a couple of times that you know we talk a lot about healthcare value creation and you know its definition. We talk about patient and condition specificity, etc. But at the heart of everything that we do in healthcare is a life, and you know that life is looking to stay healthy or get healthy, and probably no other in industry has that degree of intimacy, if you will, um, and, and that big of a charge in, in, you know, in my opinion, obviously some other issues are, you know, the industry is, is highly, highly regulated. I think another difference is, is the decoupling of, of a monetary exchange for a service rendered, right? It's, it's, it, it's, it's, quite a bit different in, in healthcare in that the actual receiver, the patient of healthcare, you know, any more is more coupled, but heretofore has not been all that coupled with um, a service or a product rendered um, a, and an actual payment for that product. Again, that's, that's changing high deductible uh, care, um, more uh, responsibility of the actual cost of care is being um, 
transferred to the patient, but 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 still different than a, than a lot of industries. There's there's a lot more, but those 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 are the ones that sort of come to mind. Wonderful. Uh, you know, another question we're getting, and I think you kind of got at this a little bit during your presentation, but I'm wondering if you can elaborate. We're asking, what is value? H how is it determined when it comes to healthcare? And, and and I also think, how as a leader, how do you communicate what value means? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I would sort of harken back to a couple of slides. I mean, truly healthcare value, again, first put forth uh, 11 or 12 years ago by by Michael Porter and Elizabeth Tysak in Redefining Healthcare. It was a really seminal piece of work. It was ahead of its time. But, it, you know, in, in its simplest form, it's it's outcomes that matter to the patient in a cost-effective way. Another way to say it is outcomes that matter to the patient over the entirety or the relevant care cycle um, over the cost to have delivered the, the, the outcome. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I don't want to reduce value to an algebraic equation, but in, in general, it at least gives us all a framework to, to discuss and have a commonality around our discussions on, on healthcare value. But at the end of the day, it's, it's an outcome important to the patient. So I think, you know, as soon as, as soon as anybody um, utters, in my opinion, the, the, the term healthcare value, if the first thing that doesn't pop into one's mind, and that is outcome important for the patient, then then then, then we've got the equation um, misaligned in, in my cost. It's not cost. It's um it's it's you know quality at this particular point in time is used as a sort of sort of decent surrogate proxy for uh, for outcome improvement I think what's also a a not so good um, proxy or surrogate for for real value or process improvements I think that we all hope that if we get our processes right and we score high on um, a host of metrics that are looking at processes you know did we order test X um, and we're hoping that if we ordered test X in some magical way, that's going to be at scale important to an outcome. In some way, we'll be able to understand that outcome over the longitudinal relevant cycle of care and then understand how the cost is tied to that outcome over time. I think it's a fallacy in, in my opinion. Yeah, others can have their opinions. Um, the only thing that matters is the outcome at the patient level. You have disease X in patient Y with risk stratification Z and cost of A. I had to go back to the beginning. Um, and, and you better understand that equation because the real superior performers, at least at the provider level, um, and even at sometimes the supplier level, are going to figure out that equation at a patient-specific risk-adjusted relevant time frame indexed against cost what is an outcome that we're going to be so sure that we can provide that we're going to go at risk um, for that outcome you know in 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 large cohorts of patients right now of course it's it's full capitation right it's full capitation sure. over a rel relatively heterogeneous patient population which i think has got its own issues and in bundled payments for care improvement in high res high resource utilization um uh, events cancer care, transplant, cardiac surgery, congestive heart failure, and the like. So outcomes, if it doesn't pop out in your mind, I think I think um, it should. Great. And, and, you know, I, I think we probably have a fair amount of uh, physicians um, on the line. I, I'm curious, uh, Dr. Theodoro, uh, why did you choose to study business and management and leadership? Uh, and how does it change how you look at health care, especially as we talk about value-based care? Yeah, so I think that's another good question. It's really been something I've wanted to do for a, for a number of years, you know, perhaps a decade and a half, and um, based on the, on a busy clinical schedule, and you know, and I've remained really quite quite busy, both from an administrative standpoint, but more importantly, a clinical standpoint. I just found that it was relatively difficult, and other people have found it not to be difficult to to go, you know, to business school in a more traditional way. But when the Jack Welch Management Institute came up on my radar, I knew that that was it for me. And what I really wanted, Adam was to to have a, a, a much deeper breadth and scope and framework, if you will, to to to, to more accurately uh, place the rapid changes that we've already talked about uh, a lot today in context. 
And so to me, it gave me a framework and a context to, um, to, to, to place these changes through the, through the lens and the eyes of a, of a formal business education. I mean, I think we, we can all pick up a lot. We can all read a lot and go to courses and classes and the like. But I mean, the totality of what I was exposed to uh, at the JWMI MBA was A, tremendous, um, and B, invaluable to, um, you know, kind of sort of to me going forward. And um, and and that that's really what I got out of it. It was it was a contextual framework that that lets lets me now see how larger segments of the economy may may look at healthcare. You know, in 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 a medical education, um, you're really not exposed to pretty much any any of the fundamental principles that would be taught in a either an undergraduate or certainly not in an MBA program. And so to me it was a new lens and it was a new context and again um really valuable. Got it. Got it. So what are specific things you've done to build trust with others? I mean we talked about how trust is really important. What are some things that leaders who are listening can take back to their offices and start tomorrow or really, you know, in the next hour? You know, I don't want to sound cheesy and use and, and use any any overblown cliches, but at the end of the day, I mean, Adam, it's really about it's 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 about authenticity and integrity and matching your your words with your actions. And I really think that while while we we may give superficial importance to words and actions, I'm not so sure that there's anything more vital than than those that than 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 authenticity. That integrity and and actually doing what you say you're going to do and letting people see that over um, a long period of time. I mean, certainly when you talk about matters of trust, this is this is a journey. Uh, it it is not some. You do not walk in with a title. You do not walk in with new letters behind your name, um, and and engender that thing that we call trust. Right? It's a feeling, and we all know that. There's it's kind of hard to objectify, quite frankly. Again, it's you know it when you see it, like, like lots of other things, but you do know it when you see it. Um, you you will begin to develop legitimate followers, right? If you want to be a leader, uh, first and foremost, it has got to be trust, and, um, and 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 people will follow you, and they'll follow you because you do what you say. Um, you have a complete coupling of words and actions. You do that over time, and you know you 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 as a leader, you're living your life a little bit more exposed than if you were not a leader. And I think that there's a there's a million different ways to 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 destroy that and it's an everyday in my opinion it's an everyday journey to to not destroy that and that's what i try to do great thank you and an audience uh, we have a little bit more time for questions so if you do have a burning question um that you'd like to ask of dr theodoro please let us know um one question i have and i'm not sure if your health system has, has been through this, but uh, what a lot of our audience are, is probably encountering right now, is, you know, is is consolidation and and mergers and acquisitions, and, and sometimes that can be tough to lead. Whether we're talking about the integration following an M and A or simply moving into merger and acquisition activity can be um, distressing for some folks. Uh, do you, do you have any tips for how to lead around um, those kind of of, of situations? Yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm gonna sound like a broken record a little bit. I'm gonna go jump immediately to the health of the organization, uh, mm -hmm. and and again, the underpinnings of that are are teams. And I so so I think that when you know one of the first is, seminal issues of of any M and A is understanding what the team is, right? So you're blending a couple of teams when you uh, by definition when you have an M and A event. And I believe that the that the uh, the leader, the new leader of the merged organization, has got as a first objective to understand what that senior leadership team looks like and to make sure that that senior leadership team as is as cohesive and trusting as is possible. You know, we sort of talked about some of the under, underpinnings of that trust. And then again, to, to, at the risk of repeating myself, it is it is an unequivocal organizational clarity. And whether that clarity changes a little bit, so if, you know, um, 
organization A and B come together and they each had their individual clarities and now are, you know, the new merged A plus B um, ha- has got to make sure that that the new entity's organizational clarity is well vetted at the senior leadership team amongst a highly cohesive group of trusting team members and then scaled throughout the organization. I really think that's got to be done as fast as possible. There's, you know, there's anxiety with any M&A. Um, there's a blending of cultures. Sometimes the cl- cultures um, happen to, to blend, you know, quite nicely. But I am, um, but I'm, but I'm sure there are examples where the cultures blend like oil and water. And so to extend that metaphor, maybe just maybe you can keep the oil and water separated if you continue to stir and blend, etc. But as soon as you stop that, they separate. And that is the death, in my opinion, of an M&A project. I so love teams that metaphor. and clarity. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great metaphor. Well, uh, what a great visual. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Theodoro. Uh, that takes us to the top of the hour, and it's uh, time to conclude today's presentation. A special thanks to our audience for the great questions, and thank you so much to our speaker, Dr. David Theodoro. To our audience, we value your, we, to your audience, we value your time and feedback. Please take a moment to fill out our brief post-webinar survey so that we can provide the best content and resources for you. We'd like to thank the sponsor of today's webinar, the Jack Welch Management Institute. You can learn more about their programs at jwmi.com. This webinar will be available on demand and a link to recording along with a copy of the slides will be emailed to you within the next 48 hours. This concludes today's presentation. Have a great day.